Well, I have to say that I was really looking forward to this retreat. After a year, I think that gave us amazing examples of gross impermanence. It seemed to be very, very timely that we look at refuge in the Four Noble Truths. I don't know about you, but my relationship to refuge was deeply examined during the uh, fire evacuation, the COVID, and with Geshe's disappearance. And uh, hoping that, you know, when difficulties arise, that my mind would go to refuge rather than worry, anxiety, blaming, or just suffering. And so when I came into the retreat here, I had a little bit of a, a clear idea on where I wanted to spend my time. And it was with the Buddha Dharma and Sangha, starting with the Buddha Jewel. And that it was, it's all about relationship. I keep saying this. I said it this morning in the motivation. I said it a few weeks ago. There's something about taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha that's about relationship. And that it takes time to build a relationship with each one of them, a trust, a confidence that they're going to lead us from this gross impermanence and everything else that comes along in samsara. And by exploring their qualities, we can eventually answer the question of whether they are worthy as objects of refuge. And so what I, what I find, I mean, it's been, I'd like to count the years that I've been a Buddhist. I, I want to be proud of that. I'm going on 27 years. And I have to say that it, the Three Jewels, the refuge in the Three Jewels has been a very, very slow process. I came into this faith with a lot of baggage from my previous religious experience. I had a lot of wonderful qualities that were grown as well. But it has really helped me to deepen my understanding of myself. You know, what does it mean to actually look deep inside and understand my own mind? How does it function? How and why do I think the way I think? And how do I, why do I experience things that I do? And how does this mind of mine actually transform? So these are the kind of questions that taking refuge in the Three Jewels has brought up to really examine. And that I came to the conclusion that what I think matters and that the Three Jewels compels me to look inside and shows me what I think about a lot of the times is influenced through these crazy distorted lenses of self-grasping ignorance and self-centered thought and ignorance in general and then all the afflictions that arise due to that. And that part of it, and that, that the distortion is what causes the suffering. I'm not seeing things as they really are. And that what I want to do and what the, the refuge has done is help me to start, I haven't been able to remove the lenses, but I've been able to get some distance or at least actually identify where the distortions are. And then to see what are the tools that the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha give me to start making some adjustments and start working on mitigating the distortions. Um, and so my, so this whole idea about relationship to the Three Jewels has taken me on this journey about relationship in general through my life. It has been, I mean, we have a lot of relationships in our life. And it's not, you know, it's with our family, our friends, our coworkers, our fellow students, our neighbors, people in authority. But we also have a relationship to objects. We have relationships to ideologies. We have relationships to experiences and adventures. And so and how many of them, you know, I look back on my life, how many of them were sources of refuge? Where did I go to find my refuge? And it was, um, and what, the, what, what was I looking for? I was searching for something or someone that would validate me as a human being, sort of validate my worth, my preciousness, um, the purpose of my life. And unfortunately, most of the time, there was a lot of disappointment. That's something that, that external things in the world just can't do. And so sooner or later, we have to go inside internally. And so what I did in this, what I've been doing for the past few days for the BBC, is to juxtaposition what are relationships in the world like in, in comparison to what the relationship to the three jewels would be like. Where are they similar and where are they different? So. I had a lot of relationships with people, a lot of relationships with experience. But I have to be honest and say that I never, I never was in a, per, an, a romantic long-term partnership ever in my life. And that my biggest relationship was my quest for freedom. And you have heard this before. This has been my life koan. What I thought it was, where am I going to find this freedom? 
And thinking about being in an intimate long-term relationship seemed to be totally antithetical to my search for freedom. So needless to say, I had no interest in family, marriage, getting a house, having children, in-laws, and all that happens in long-term relationships. However, what was interesting is that I surrounded myself, especially when I moved to the West here back in 1996, I surrounded myself with a lot of people in relationship. And for the most part, they looked to be fairly healthy relationships. There were friends that were young, young couples that had children. People had been, this was their second or third relationship. They were working on it. Some had been together for 40, 50 years. And I spent a lot of time with them. And I had a blast. And we were into worldly fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun. But when I met the Dharma and things started to change, I wanted to hang out with Venerable and the, you know, the, the community at the Dharma Friendship Foundation. Some of my friends got a little bit worried about me because most of them weren't Buddhists. And before I moved to the Abbey, um, one of them particularly said to me, you know, Nance, if you really want to become a full human being and really realize your potential, you have to be in a committed relationship. There is no place where you're going to learn to grow, compromise, forgive, love, live fully as a human being. And there's Nance moving to the monastery, where as far as my myth went, and their myth might have gone, is that there is going to be no opportunity for relationship, commitment, honesty, compromise, or forgiveness. Silly thought, but that was there anyway. But, you know, as Lama Yeshi says, they means well. And a lot of my friends, for the most part, my Dharma friends were just excited that I was coming. And, of course, I wanted to be with Venerable and to help fulfill in whatever way I could this aspiration to start the Abbey. But I came to realize that somewhere along the line, I think I had been tracking it for most of my life, is that there was a sense that I was somehow deficient, that there might be some kind of failing because I couldn't put that one-on-one -on -one relationship together for any amount of time, that there was something that I was escaping, that I was running away from something, or I was a coward at some level, because I had no, no desire to go in that direction. So I had this nagging thought, and it followed me to the Abbey. So I had an exchange with Venerable early on, 2004, 2005, that her response to this this idea I had, that I'd had for like 30 years, she put it to rest for the most part. And it was the most interesting exchange. We were, I was driving her to create. Soon after Venerable came to the Abbey, she started figuring out where she could go in Newport to share the Dharma without saying Dharma. You know, she's brilliant at this, giving the Buddhist teachings without bringing up any kind of Dharma language. So we had started at the Newport Library that turned to be an interesting configuration, too small or something. So we went to create this lovely little Dharma, little art center in Newport. Some of our shikshamanas gave some talks this fall. And there were maybe sometimes 15 to 20, 25 people. I think Venerable Deke was one of the people who came. And we'd send out flyers, we'd put things in the minor, and there would be uh, things like love, um, reward or punishment. She did the four measurables, which was a really beautiful, I remember it very, very well that night. She really had people transfixed on how she described that. Uh, forgiveness, compassion, relationship. There must have been something, because on the drive home, I said something about this nagging thought I had. You know, am I a coward? Should I have done that before I came here to make sure that I knew what I was, you know, not going to be missing? Did I, did I fail in this particular human activity? And she looked over at me, and she just laughed. And she said, Nance, you should rejoice in all the negative karma you didn't create by being in these relationships. Think of all the clinging attachment, all the jealousy, all the anger swimming in the eight worldly concerns that you avoided, and the suffering that would follow now and in the future, because you didn't do that. You presented yourself a great kindness. And then she said, if you want to develop as a full human being, the Dharma is the way to do it, and here you are. <laughs> that was 20 years ago, and I remember that conversation, and it has guided me. And she was right. The three jewels have compelled, and they compel all of us to redefine what relationship is, what refuge is, and what the huge differences are. 
So I went ahead and I put together my little list of what the differences are and some of the similarities using the three good qualities of the Buddha's mind. I'm on the Buddha jewel right now, and Venerable Chuni mentioned them last week. It's uh, uh, knowledge, great passion, great compassion, and uh, power, or enlight enlightening activities, Geshe Zogba calls it. Okay, so first of all, the Buddha, the three jewels, they are 100% there. They're not bored. They're not distracted. They are always there. Yet, there are no expecta expectations, there's no agenda, there's no strategy, there's no faults, just endless love, wishing to be of benefit to us, but not being pushy about it. They are always there, ready to go deep. They're not watching games, cruising the web, going to sleep. Whenever you're ready to talk, be honest, regret, be kind, rejoice, gain wisdom, show humility, they are there in full support. And what are the qualities that we couldn't stand about people, and even in here in the community, you know, gosh, you know what, she thinks she knows everything. Well, guess what? We have a relationship with someone who knows everything. <laughs> and it's a blessing, you know? The fact that the Buddha knows the conventional mode and the ultimate mode of existence, there's nothing that's going to surprise him. So he, you know, why is he such a perfect friend? He's got, there's so many ways. Okay, so if we're going to seek safety and acceptance in long-term relationships, he wants somebody who knows, okay? So having an omniscient partner is really nice to have because you don't have to put it into words. The other thing that's great about him being omniscient is that he, you know, we used, to, we used to want people to read our minds, you know? Why can't they figure out what I need and what I want? Why can't they, why don't they know when I just don't want to be talked to or when I want to be held? Guess what? Having an omniscient friend really puts all that mind reading up to a whole different level. So there's something nice about having a friend who's omniscient. But... You know, he's not frightened off by our craziness or our rational thinking, our afflicted states of mind, how we lose it. He knows our struggles. He knows the causes of them. And when we're ready, he's more than happy to share some of the things that he learned on how to solve them. You know, there's no pushiness coming from the Buddha's side. The Buddha knows everything about us and living beings. <clears throat> but, you know, with all this knowledge and all this knowing, the Buddha has to have great compassion. I mean, gosh, when I was thinking about what it is that he actually, how his great compassion, which never ceases, talk about having his undivided attention on us all the time, it doesn't wander away, is that he understands, as Lama Sankapa describes in three principal aspects of the path, tied by the strong bonds of karma so hard to undo, Caught in the iron net of self-grasping egoism, completely enveloped by the darkness of ignorance. Born and reborn in cyclic existence, unceasingly tormented by the three sufferings. That says it all about our situation. And affliction, and Geshe Zopa says, afflictions and karma seem to take control over us. They govern our lives so that we don't have freedom. You can really, sometimes you just feel that. You just, you're out of control. You're being pulled by your afflictions, by your karma. Now, the Buddha has completely eliminated all afflictions, all ignorance, all obscurations that drive these suffering states of mind that we experience. Yet, in some way, he too is inextricably bound. And he is inextricably bound by his great compassion. In some sense, the Buddha is not free. His compassion binds him to us and all sentient beings. When His Holiness was asked, how did the Buddha take the journey to awakening? His Holiness responded, for eons he cultivated compassion until he was totally overtaken by it. But because he sees that everything lacks any inherent nature, that is empty of any inherent existence. He's never going to fall into personal distress. He's never going to get burned out about helping us try to alleviate our suffering. He knows our potential. He knows our fundamental nature. The, the tragedy for the Buddha is that he sees so much of this is so unnecessary. That's probably what, what that ties him, really ties him, is the unnecessary suffering that we experience that he knows doesn't have to be there. 
But what could we want from somebody so dear? Undivided attention 24-7. So the challenge then, and I'm not going to do the third one, which is the enlightening activity of the Buddha, which has got a whole bunch of stuff to it, is that we have to meet him halfway. Now, so far it sounds like the Buddha is 100%, whatever, you know, you can do. But when you get to the third one, which is the good qualities of enlightening influence, he wants us to have some skin in the game. And I'll tell you about that the next time I say it.